Okay, welcome back everybody. So <clears throat> today I'm gonna to try to split the lecture roughly. I mean, we'll probably do a little bit more than half on planning under uncertainty. There's a lot to say there, but I'm gonna, I think in the spirit of this is a boutique lecture, kind of at the end, we're gonna give you some of the reasons why you might wanna learn more and just some of the key ideas of planning under uncertainty. Uh, and then I really like to spend a little bit of time just kind of summarizing what we did. We, we picked up a lot of tools. I think the connective tissue that puts them all together is still forming, you know, and I think it's just useful to kind of um, make some of those connections again, remember what we learned, why we learned them, how they've come up in your projects, and, and wrap it up like that. So let's give a few examples about why you might want to do planning under uncertainty. So <clears throat> maybe... Oh. Um, maybe one example would be at the task level, right? If I, so if I asked one of Billion's chatbots or you know, whatever, the, if I said, you know, hey, robot, get me uh, the, I don't know, I have to think of something that has uncertainty, but get me the mustard. And maybe, um, maybe because of our massive understanding of the way kitchens are laid out and where people put things, maybe there's, I don't know, a 40% chance that it's in the fridge. I don't know if you refrigerate your mustard or not. I know it's a, it's a personal uh, choice, right? Maybe there's a 30% chance it's in the cupboard. Maybe there's a, I don't know, 10% chance there's one in the pantry. And maybe, I don't know, 20% chance we're just out. You got to go to the store, right? So a planner thinking about the task level that's only thinking about, let's say, the most likely scenario is going to be impoverished in the way in its ability to accomplish the task, for sure, right? But... <clears throat> not only in the total success, right, of if it's not in the fridge, it fails, but also maybe if, it, if the robot is already in the pantry for something else, even if it's a low probability, maybe it's worth a quick check before you take the time to drive over to the, to the fridge, right? So reasoning about probabilities at the level of decision-making is, is hugely important. And I think the, at the task level, it's sort of, uh, it's sort of clear, I think. Uh, I guess with... Um, you know, with all the, thing, all the large language models that, that Boyan was talking about, maybe there's like a 10% chance that it'll tell you to pour a water over your head or something like this too, right? But uh, that's the Wild West. <clears throat> okay, but it, it turns out it's super useful down at the like dexterous manipulation control level too. So um, let me think of a good example. So I actually brought a plate so I can make... One of my favorite examples is... Um, one that came up when we were loading dishes a lot, right? So I brought a dish. I would have brought the dish rack, but that didn't work out. Um, okay, so it turns out the way that the robot, let me imagine this is the rack in the bottom of the dishwasher, okay? And the way that our robot loaded dishes was very characteristically, it would grab the plate, have a pretty good you know, thing, and then it would line up the plate above and go down, right? And that always bugged me. It always bugged me, right? Because Humans don't do that whatsoever. They do it much faster, first of all, but they also take a fundamentally different strategy, right? They come in, they almost always make contact, they're compliant, and they go in like this. Does that make sense, right? Instead of having a sort of straight line trajectory where the, the plate, you kind of estimate, possibly with some accuracy, the location of the tines in the, in the tray, right? and line up the plate perfectly and try to put it straight down. And I think a human would come in at an angle 
intentionally make contact here, then passive mechanics would have it rotate up a little bit and it would kind of slide down. The only explanation for that is something about being more robust, something about uncertainty, not needing to accurately uh, understand the orientation of the plate or the position of the tines, right? And it's actually a, just a fundamentally different strategy at the level of the controller because, because we are implicitly thinking about uncertainty. We saw another one too that in, your, um, in our journey here, right? Remember the example of pushing the book? This was the example of force control where you wanted to control the, the friction between the friction cones between the finger and the book. You also wanted the book and the table. But right there, what's that motion right there, right? And then he's going to go around and pick it up. The only justification for that second motion was that he could reduce the uncertainty of the orientation of the book. Right? So as he slid it around, right, he even rotated the book, it was all about the friction cones. Right? And the exact orientation of the book was some relatively subtle function of the friction cones. But by coming in with this known position of the fingers, even if the book was at a relatively different orientation, if he starts pushing, it's going to line the book up nicely. And it's a very robust strategy that would get it to the end of the table at a known location. That's the only justification for that middle move. Otherwise, it was completely worthless. Right? So even at the level of planning control, reasoning about uncertainty really matters. And I think the hallmarks of a system that is reasoning about uncertainty and planning and control are pretty clear, right? So One of them is certainly just a level of robustness that you can obtain if you're thinking about all the things that could possibly happen, not just planning optimistically through the world, right? And there's various ways to talk about robustness, and um, <clears throat> some of them I would certainly put under this umbrella, but there's other approaches that can achieve robustness, I guess. But I think the absolute hallmark identifying feature of a system that's reasoning about uncertainty when it's making its decisions is information gathering actions. We will see examples um, throughout the lecture here of cases where the robot does something fundamentally different. You need to program it fundamentally different, not for the sake of accomplishing the task of getting the book to a certain orientation, but actually just for the sake of gaining information, reducing uncertainty, and, and using that reduced uncertainty to accomplish the task with higher confidence, okay? So really, if you don't have uncertainty reasoning, you know, flowing through your system, you will, you will never see robots making actions just to gain information. That, that's, a, that, you know, that's a property that only happens if you're trying to, to think about optimizing uncertainty or, or something like that. Okay, so you need a whole stack to start reasoning about uncertainty. You know, you need to think about stack uh, you know, uncertainty at the level of perception. Uh, and then we're going to talk mostly about how to use it in planning and control. Luckily, our perception systems are actually pretty good. Uh, like There's lots of ways that we already have uh, probabilities flowing through a lot of our state-of-the-art perception systems. right? So the image recognition was putting out probability that it was a sheep, probability that it was a dog, probability that it was a cat, so on and so forth. That's just one example, but you know, we talked about pose estimation where it was outputting entire distributions over possible orientations of the, uh, of the mugs, right? Uh, we talked about key point estimators that weren't putting out XYZ coordinates of the key points, but were actually putting out a belief, I mean, well, a, a heat map over possible orientation, uh, locations of the, of, the, of the key point, right? And over and over and over again, you'll see people have, I mean, certainly neural networks are capable of putting out lots of interesting things. Oftentimes, those interesting things include distributions over possible outcomes, right? And I don't think there's a, a big barrier anymore to asking your perception system to, to tell you a little bit about how confident it is. There are different types of uncertainty, right? You might have 
heard about aleatoric versus epistemic uncertainty, and, and there are different ways to ask neural networks to address them. I won't, I won't dig into those, but, but there are great, actually, at the perception level, I think there's many good ways to think about uncertainty. The challenge, though, becomes, and the, the thing we'll focus on here, is how do you consume those estimates of uncertainty down through the planning and control stack? Because we haven't said anything about that yet. So how do you make long-term decisions that reason about uncertainty? Well, if you're gonna make long-term decisions, if you're gonna make a plan, you need a model. So we need to think about a model of how our uncertainty is gonna change over time if we make certain decisions. So that I know if I make this decision, it's gonna, my uncertainty might evolve in some way. If I make a different decision, I would like it to evolve in some other way. And that way, I'm gonna choose my actions based on the way the uncertainty is gonna evolve, right? So we need a model for the way the uncertainty evolves, the dynamics of the uncertainty, right? And there's, um, you know, there's lots of ways to think about this. There's, this is stochastic processes and stochastic dynamics. There's lots of things to think about. But we've actually already written down everything we need. When I write this general form of, you know, f of x is potentially x, n right, where I had my randomness coming in here. Right, if I've, if I've authored my systems in this way, where the randomness, the random variables come in here, then I have a, I actually already have a model of uncertainty and how the uncertainty can propagate through the system. But so far, we've been just talking about this dynamics here, and we've been only saying, you know, for simulation, for instance, we've just been saying, I'm gonna take a random draw of this, I'm gonna evaluate what the next xn is. For planning, we've so far pretended that that's just zero, for instance, okay, and we've done deterministic planning. And today I want to say, well, let's say we want to do planning where we admit that this one's not zero. And I think it's easiest to think about that first if I were to, if we look at this just for notational reasons, if only, uh, <clears throat> to look at this in the case where I, I have a finite state x, u, and finite noise kind of uh, w, right? So that would be the standard sort of tabular Markov decision process, or we're gonna do a partially observable Markov decision process. So um, let's, you know, to start, let's say that state action and observations are all um, discrete, right? So there's a finite number, uh, discrete and finite. There's a finite number of states I could be in, a finite number of actions I could be in, a finite number of observations. That's not what our manipulation systems look like, but that's just how I'll write the problem. I'll just avoid writing more probability notation than I need to in order to tell the basic, that basic story. <clears throat> So this, I could have done, there's nothing in those equations that say that x is a continuous variable or u is a continuous variable. I could write exactly those equations where x is just, uh, you know, this is a, a transition map, okay. But when we talk about belief space planning, we normally write this in a slightly different way. We'll write now the probability over initial conditions, let's say, would be a function of x, which would be the, um, the probability distribution over initial conditions. And then I'll write the dynamics here, which is coming in as a random variable here, but I can write that just as a probability of transitioning to some new state, given I'm in some current state. It depends on P, but it doesn't depend on W here. This would be my transition probabilities. And similarly, I can write my observations as being probabilities that are conditioned on um, 
on my state and my action. So is that, I don't know how, um, how comfortable everybody is with probability notations, but I just want to make it clear that um, you know, this, is, this is sort of a deterministic way to write a, pro a stochastic equation where I say there's a random variable coming in, but this is a deterministic function. I could equivalently write that as saying, I want to know given x, u, and p, for instance, what is a distribution over y? And that sort of removes this from the argument, and I have a distribution over possible. Is that, is that clear how I could write the same thing in two different ways with two different notations? For instance, if this was a, a Gaussian, right, and I'm pushing this through, and maybe this is a linear equation with a Gaussian here, then I could write the output as a Gaussian distribution, okay? That would be not a function of W, or I could say make a specific draw and tell me the specific value that comes out on the other side. And the reason it's so nice to do the fully discrete case is that I can represent each of these just with a finite set of numbers then, right? So the, how would I represent a probability over possible x's? Well, maybe if x is drawn from just some number of possible x's, or maybe I'll, I just, I, I realize I got a notational overlap there, but <clears throat> I've got some notational, um, some, some finite set of x's, then my probability over x, of, I'll write of x zero, I should, that'll clear up my notational overlap. My probability of x zero, I could just write it as a vector, which is the, this is the probability that x zero is x like this, probability x zero, x one, Right? It's just a vector. And similarly, the, the transition probabilities, well, they're going to be, it's almost a matrix, but since I've got two variables, it's actually a little easier to think about it as a tensor, actually, now. I wouldn't have done that a few years ago, but now I can just say tensor, and everybody's good. Right? Think about that as a tensor. For, for every u, I, can, I have a matrix of, that maps from my current x to my next x prime. And all the machinery goes through very nicely when you just have tables of numbers. And the question of how do you represent a probability distribution is just is not there when you have a finite list of numbers. Okay, so what's going to happen now is we're going to have um, we're going to we're going to watch how this system can evolve under the probability distributions. What what is the sort of state evolution of my probabilities? Sorry. Oops, twice. The state of the system, I would say, is clearly, you know, the state of the plant is clearly x, right? That's what we've always been calling the state. But from the perspective of the observer, someone who's trying to, to track what's happening going on with, with x. We need a little bit more than just x to summarize what's going on, okay? So it actually gets very deeply into the things we've been talking about. With, we've talked about different, how to learn different state representations, what makes a good state. Do people know what's the definition of a state? What is the fundamental property that sort of defines a state? You know. Okay, so he says minimal and sufficient uh, information to predict the next state. Yes, I mean almost, right? So, so, I, so we could argue about whether states need to be minimal or not. I think you, you could talk about a minimal representation for state. I'll, uh, I'll we're going minimalism for now. Okay, the question is, so yeah, a state is something that lets you fully predict the next state. That's a, that's a good, super good definition, but it's not actually the definition we want here, right? 
because the system is stochastic, we can't perfectly predict the next state. So we need a slightly richer notion of what's state. A slightly richer definition, but completely consistent, is that a state is a set of information, a set of numbers, for instance, that lets you forget all of the other things you've seen. It's a sufficient statistic for all of the history of your observations. Okay. So if I wanted to write the evolution of this system, if I wanted to predict, for instance, what is the probability of y at the nth step being, I don't know, the ith y, conditioned on all of the things I've seen so far, u0, u1, u2, up to, let's say, u n minus 1, but also y0, y1, up to y n minus 1. Potentially, the next y I expect to see, or with the distribution over y's I expect to see, is a function of all of the things I've seen in the past. Okay. What we want is to summarize all of the things I've seen in the past so that the prediction based on a state that represents this is the same as if I had all of the histories. Right? So I want to say the probability over y n equals y i conditioned on some b, I'm going to call it, b here, b n, and maybe u n, since that's coming in right now, okay, is, a, is equivalent to having all of that prior information. Okay, so this state here, what, what does it mean to be a good state? It means it's a sufficient statistic for the history, or a sufficient summary, let's say, of my entire history of observations. Okay, so for the purposes of the observer, the state that you want to track, this state, this thing called B, is called a belief state. And we want to make sure we get our head around that and then use it for planning. Okay, so a belief state is some efficient, hopefully, not always, but some, let's say, numerical summary of all of the things that I've done and that I've seen in the past that is sufficient for me to predict what's going to happen in the future. And for these sort of Markov processes and dynamical systems of this form, there's a natural choice for the belief state. It's not a unique choice. It's certainly not a minimal choice in most cases. Okay. A minimal choice would be to say that the belief, let me say the, I'll use it as a vector again since everything's nice in the continuous thing. So I've got a belief vector and the belief at, for the element i of that vector is going to be the probability that x at n equals x i condition on u0, u1, y0, y1, and so on and so forth. So the belief, a sufficient statistic that allows me to forget everything I've seen is a probability distribution over all of the possible states I might be in. Okay, and that's a super powerful thing. It says that all I need to keep, if, no matter how long my history was, no matter how, how many observations I have, if I just summarize my current estimated probability of what's in the, you know, of, of being in state zero and state, state one, state two, it's just a vector, one vector, right? If I can just keep track of that, then I have everything. I don't need to remember anything else about the past. And more because of that, because it's sufficient, 
summarize the past and to predict the future, it's also sufficient for optimal decision making. So it turns out we know that the optimal controllers, optimal policies, must be of the form un is some high star, it could be a function of n potentially, of bn. Even when the system is partially observable, right? So in, in the case where y just shows me x and without noise, for instance, then x actually, you know, b can just be x. And all, those, all the things we already know still work if they still fit in this framework. Because my probability distribution collapses to just a single point. Okay? But in general, I have to keep a tr an entire state distribution over x. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. Um, it's a, I, I wish I had like a one-liner for that, um, but but it is uh, it is true. So um, I mean, you can you can derive it recursively from these equations. If I gave, if I wrote out all the, the equations, you can see it recursively in the algebra and everything like that. Um, it's also the tenet of of filtering. So uh, the Bayes optimal filter, for instance, it takes exactly this form. Okay, but um, without all that machinery, I have to ask you for a little bit of a leap of faith, maybe. Yeah, but thank you for, for asking it. Okay, so now our new commodity is to traffic in these beliefs. Now the problem, caveat, you know, uh, uh, spoiler alert, sometimes uh, it's hard to keep track of all the possible, to write a distribution over big complicated things. This might be the shape of the um, mustard bottle. It could be the time of the day. It could be that there's a lot of things to potentially keep track of in the world, and it becomes uh, untenable to try to keep track of all the problem, a distribution over everything that could possibly happen. But in the smaller problems, and you know, with selected targeted reasoning about uncertainty, you can, you can do very well with this. Okay, so this is amazing. I mean, I'll give you a, f a few examples here. So, um, there's a classic example of that people talk about in the partially observable Markov decision process of discrete worlds that have discrete observations. One of them is a cheese maze. It's a silly thing, but there's, I don't know, cheese here, okay? And the mouse has to go and find the cheese, okay? And there's a discrete number of places that the mouse might be, for instance. And there's, um, there's observations. So when you're in a certain place in the, in, on the board, if the mouse, I'm not going to draw a mouse. Well, maybe I can draw a mouse. But uh, yeah, something with the tail and the uh, ears. OK. There's a mouse running around the maze. Luckily, the mouse can see the numbers that we put down, which are like signposts which tell it where it is. And the interesting cheese mazes are the ones that have uh, observations that don't tell you exactly where you are. They give you an indication, they give you information about where you are, but they don't instantly determine where you are because maybe there's the number two appears in multiple places, okay? Something like this is a, a classic one. Maybe there's five all these, in all these places, six, seven, six, okay? So what is the evolution of this um, belief going to be. So if, I, if the mouse wakes up and is following Bayes optimal, you know, it's a, it's a Bayes optimal mouse, uh, then it's keeping track of a finite list of probabilities, right? B at zero, maybe it thinks, uh, I think there's 11 things here, right? So maybe there's equal probability everywhere that there's, that it could be anywhere in the board. And then it sees and maybe, it's, maybe I should have started down in a more interesting place, but maybe it sees two at the first time step, and after one observation, it's collapsed its belief to being zero in most places, but there's still half of probability that I'm in this place and wherever the next one is, and the rest are zeros, right? And as, as the mouse moves through the board, it's updating its probability distribution over possible states. 
And the recipe for updating that falls directly out of Bayes' rule applied to those, the, those forward dynamics. For a more complicated and more robotics version of that, maybe, um, people, do, people know, might know a lot about state uh, estimation and Monte Carlo filtering and the like. This is one of the first ones that kind of um, popularized probabilistic robotics, okay? So this is a, a, a robot, uh, a trash can robot moving around with a sonar because that's what we had back in the day, okay? And, um, and you could think about this as being a much more complicated cheese maze and the observations are now the depth returns of the sonar. If I start it over again, it starts off with probability all over. This is sampled versions of that probability. And as it gets sonar returns, right, it gets information about where it is, but it doesn't completely determine where it is. And it has a probability mass, which is like that vector, all over the space. And as it evolves, it can do pretty complicated things, right? That's, that's just a more sophisticated version of this super simple example. Okay. Now, what's essential? Now, this is, the, this is the point of this part of the lecture. Um, what's essential is that the rules that govern the update of the probability, of the belief distribution, just have dynamics that we can write down. It's just another system, okay? You can write down the, the evolution through Bayes' optimal filter. B is a function of n plus one, is just some function of B of n, U of n, and Y of n, right? It's a system that looks like this. U going in, observations coming in. It's got an internal state B inside it. Maybe it's, you can put the B on the output port if you want. That isn't actually essential here. And if you have goals that are specified, for instance, that I want to get to a certain belief, I want to, with high probability, be where the cheese is, or I want to be in some room in the map with high probability, then the task is just like what we've done before, where it's a, a, a task of choosing the U subject to the dynamics F that moves around the target V. Okay, as a result, all of the tools that we've already do, talked about, well, we, you know, uh, with some caveats, but, but the, the basic tools we've talked about can work. So you, once you have this problem, for instance, you can do trajectory optimization. And I would say the dominant approaches maybe would, for, for large scale things would be a trajectory optimization kind of approach or, um, or a sample -based, sampling based motion planning type approach. And this is, so we've talked mostly in this class about kinematic trajectory optimization. This is really a dynamic trajectory optimization. That's the, the biggest caveat I have for you is that you have to think about, um, you do have to think about the fact that you can't take arbitrary paths through B. The dynamics of this function F do limit you. So, you know, the types, it's an underactuated system. Pretty good, right? Uh, but uh, it, is, it is actually interesting and hard because it's an underactuated system. You don't have enough actuators to control your entire belief, okay? And so actually the trajectory optimization versions we do in underactuated are more suitable than the kinematic trajectory, but it's, very, it's a, a small extension from the types of things we've done. Okay, so you can do trajectory optimization over U subject to constraints that B has some Initial condition, final condition, you can put a cost on B, so on and so forth. Now, almost, right? So there's one important difference here. Why, as I've written it here, as this system's perspective, why is still a random variable coming in? It's a function of, um, it's a function of X and U, but also it has some, it could be a noisy measurement. So you either, so you actually have to do a form of stochastic trajectory optimization, or you can make a choice to sort of um, be optimistic about your observations, why? 
But people have studied that nicely how you can do this. You could do stochastic trajectory optimization. If you've heard of iterative LQG, that actually would be, if I were to recommend one thing to solve these problems, I would recommend iterative LQG. We had some work that tried to be optimistic about why and used deterministic trajectory optimization to do it, okay? But actually the flavor of this is very much just trajectory optimization gets you pretty far. Okay, so let me tell you that uh, version of it, okay? So this is a toy version of the problem. Um, imagine you're the, a point robot. Starting here, that's the initial conditions. We call this the light dark domain. It's just a very, it's the simplest kind of instance of a, of a problem which has state dependent observation noise, okay? So the basic thing is that it's dark over here. Your position sensors are noisy when it's dark. And over here, it's light. The positions, the sensors are pretty accurate when it's light. Your goal is to get to zero, zero, zero. If you thought, if you didn't reason at all about uncertainty, and you were, had a pretty, you're, you felt like you were uh, in this initial condition, that was the mean of your initial conditions, then you take a straight line here, okay? But if you have, if you have uh, process noise too, for instance, you might end up actually very far from there. If you write an optimization to say, I'd like to get here, but I'd like to get here with some confidence. I'd like my belief to be narrowly distributed around that goal, then it actually makes sense to go into the light in, in order to come back to the dark. Okay, so this is explicitly an information gathering action that you don't get from deterministic reasoning, but you do get from reasoning over belief state. The reason there's two curves is that we were talking about two different ones. This is one just based on linearizing the whole equations and doing basically one step of the iterative LQG kind of algorithm. And this one's based on a direct trajectory optimization, a kinematic trajectory, uh, dynamic trajectory optimization. Okay, but they, the, the principle is the same, is that only because you're learning about uncertainty did you choose to go into the light to come back. The specific opt objective here, oh yeah, please. That's true. In order to figure it out. But then in real life, like, I don't know, at this time step, I don't know how my uncertainty would evolve, like, 10 steps down the line. So how can I plan an optimal trajectory right now all the way to the end if I don't know how it will evolve? You don't know that, so this is a very deep question. Thank you. So the question is, if I'm now, I can't know how my, how my uh, distribution is going to evolve. There's, so, um, you can know the, how the distribution over distribution is gonna evolve, okay? So um, what you, what you don't know what sensor measurement you're gonna get at time three in the future, okay? That you have to either think about all possible, the random variable of, of, of possible measurements I get at time three, or you can say, um, I'm gonna propagate where I think I'll be at time three, and then assume that I'm gonna get a particular measurement at time three in order to keep going. But, but actually, uh, you do, you, you can't, this is a, this is a complete, if we agree that we have a, dy a dynamic model of how things go and what my measurement noise is, for instance, I, I do have, understand things like if I were to look around here, I would have a different view of what's behind here, and I would expect to get, I don't know what's behind here, but I know that I get more information to reduce my uncertainty about what's behind this paper if I were to move here. And that turns out to be very powerful uh, enough that it causes you to take information gathering actions. And then, because you might be surprised, and what you find there might very much determine what you do, we often use this in a replanning cycle. So you'd, you'd, you'd plan, but if you ever see something that then dramatically changed your view of the world, you just replan. But that's a great question. The particular uh, objective here, just to, to think about it, so instead of representing this as a, a, a table of possible locations here, the representation here was a mean and covariance over possible locations. And the goal was to say, I like to be here uh, where my mean was at the goal, but my covariance was as small as possible. Find a trajectory and there was some cost on, uh, I should have put in the cost on action too. So, but it would go across here and then and come back and with as small as possible. And it was better to go into the light 
than to take the straight path. Okay, so that's still a little abstract. Here's a robotics version of it, okay, a manipulation version of it. So let's say that you know there's gonna be two boxes in front of you, but you don't know the size or location of the boxes. Let me just read it carefully. The robot must localize the pose and dimensions of the boxes using a laser scanner mounted on the wrist, right, on the left wrist. It's relatively easy when the boxes are separated, but when they're squished together like C on the right, then it's actually pretty hard, okay? So this is a simple example of if the robot is taking information gathering actions, it'll actually do something different in order to increase its confidence of the location of the box before it picks it up. And you put this into the trajectory optimization formulation where you, you take measurements as, as laser scanners out there and it actually decides to go off and push on the left in order to get a better sensor reading of the right and it's tracking a distribution over possible uh, poses of the box and, and the like, and it makes the decision just with trajectory optimization to, to take that information gathering action, right, to reduce its uncertainty, and then it goes to pick up the box. But that same algorithm, if the boxes started off separate, it did its first scan and found it was fairly confident it would have just gone in to pick up the box. Right? Same thing here. You can actually see the, this is a rendering of the distribution over those possible locations. Of course, it's a high dimensional thing, so it's plotted down in a, um, in a way that's a little bit hard. To, that's why it's periodic, is because it's the raft of higher dimensional things plotted on a single line, okay? And the big robot would, would make those decisions. You're saying local minima of trajectory optimization? Yes. Um, yeah. It's a really big question. So, so do, do, is this kind of trajectory optimization more sensitive to, to local minima, for instance? In some way, I actually think it might be less sensitive, even though it's solving a harder problem, because for the same reason we talked about with the randomized smoothing and the whatever, I actually think that um, putting distributions over possible outcomes uh, smooths out some of the kinks in the cost landscape, and uh, it might be a little less sensitive. But it would still have... The big local minima will still be there, but it might get rid of some of the small local minima. So maybe we're just getting um, the three dimensional information gathered, but the robot is still smaller. But the objective, the objective kind of gives greater confidence and we need to gather information. Do you feel like in some case, in some sense, our knowledge or some kind of learning algorithm that has optimized an objective would kind of also do something like that? Awesome, you know, awesome. Yeah, that, that's actually the last point I want to make. So that's, that's, that's really good. So, so just to be clear, this, this is doing information gathering, right? That is, that push, I would consider to be only valuable for the sake of gathering information. But it's part of the objective? Like, you have to gather more information? Nope, the, the goal here is to, well, with high probability, pick up the box. And the only reason it does that is to, um, uh, is to reduce its uncertainty, to gather information. Okay, but the second part of Leroy's question was actually the, the, the biggest last point I want to make here, which is that um, this really does have deep connections to the state realization questions we've been talking about. I'll put it in a different slide just so we're not watching that. Um, <clears throat> okay, so, so now I'm, imagine I'm uh, doing system ID, right? Input output system ID, for instance, to try to learn a state representation. In order to accurately predict my future observations, if I'm going to learn a state space model for this, uh, we've, you know, in the linear system ID setting, we sort of thought about this as we've got a deterministic system we're trying to recover, and it did recover the A, B, C, D matrices pretty well. But if I have a stochastic system here that it's trying to recover, and its objective is to predict Y with its highest confidence possible, then the state it has to learn is, to be, is actually, I think, better thought about as a belief state. Now again, the belief states are not unique. I mean, all the stuff we talked about with similarity transforms and the like is still present here. And it might be that the belief state is not minimal, that having tracking all the things that the real state might do might be more than you need to predict why. 
when we talked about approximate information states, that's exactly the idea of finding a state representation in here, which is an approximate belief state. Similarly, if I'm doing um, RL, let's say, uh, let's say from via policy gradient, or uh, if you do a, a, you know, a policy gradient with a dynamic policy, like an LSTM or something, right? Or if you have a value function or a Q function that has some dynamic, some states. By the way, I think if you do that, you've walked away from RL theory. I think there's, I mean, people are working on that theory now, but that's not the standard thing to do uh, <clears throat> in theory, but people do it in practice now. They'll put an LSTM representing the value function or the Q function. Um, and the states that this thing has to acquire in order to accomplish the task, let's say we had an oracular you know, agent that would just solve the RL problem and solve the representation along with it, then the dynamic, the state in the controller is probably best understood as being an approximate state of the belief space of the, of the system. That's what's required to make optimal decisions. Similarly, the value function, if, if trained, you know, so, but this would be a task relevant approximate state, right? And this one similarly would be just the part of the belief space you, space you would need in order to accurately predict values. Okay, so I do think RL is potentially doing this. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that's the, the, the language of belief is exactly the right way to think about what RL is, is doing in those cases. So you should learn more about belief space planning. It's good stuff. Yeah. Okay, let me step back and just cover the course again in a few minutes, right? Um, I, just, I think it's really helpful to just sort of connect it all together. So we've done a lot of things, covered a lot of tools, sometimes at a level that I wish I could spend four lectures on. But we spent less. But I hope you came away with a lot of, a lot of tools. And I've, I've, it's been very rewarding for me to see you guys hit some of the subtler points in your projects, for instance, right? Um, so let's do a kind of a, where have we been? People also asked in the survey for things like um, predict manipulation 40 years in the fu future. I, that's hard, but I'll, you know, I'll, I'll try to say a few things about where maybe where it's going to, okay? Um, okay, so we started off, you know, after the basic introduction, we started talking, talk, starting off with just like, you know, basic kinematics, Jacobians, stuff like that. Um, the multibody notation is something that I doubt too many people will move forward with as part of your major, like, um, part of your life. But if you do, you'll be happier, I promise. I think I've seen bugs <laughs> in notebooks that, I mean, I, I, I've made my, my own, you know, like if, if you find yourself frustrated that the Jacobian you got out of diff IK is in the wrong frame, or your forces are somehow seem to be like in the wrong space or something like this, more careful use of multi-body notation will save you. Consider it, you know? Um, it really does help, I think. And I think the general view, I try to push sort of um, less about the mechanics of the kinematic equations, which is a, a slightly more standard treatment. But I think thinking of it as a spatial algebra and understanding the basic operations of how rotations affect frames and stuff like this, um, I, you know, that's a, that's a lesson that we came back to multiple times. And I really do think a lot of you found that the differential IK pipeline became a, a workhorse for, the, you know, for your projects, a lot of people using it. And some of you um, really, I think, got to appreciate it, or maybe you're mad at it, but, it, but um, you know, a month from now, you'll be really appreciative of it, maybe. Uh, for instance, I, one of my regrets is that a bunch of people copied the Iwa Painter notebook, and that had only used pseudo-inverse control, not the full diff IK, because it, uh, that was sufficient for that notebook, and I hadn't sort of pictured everybody copying it and trying to use it for more than it was good for. The pseudo-inverse controller can run into singularities, right? 
and some of you did. And it blows up. Unfortunately, the way it blows up is it causes multi-body plant to say, I can't, or it says the integrator, you know, I, I, I run into time step equals 1e to the minus 14, and that's not a very clear message, but okay, fine. That was just the pseudo inverse being insufficient. And if you switched over to the diff ik, which was the least squares interpretation, which allowed you to have constraints, then those issues went away, right? So the differential ik as an optimization, I think is a workhorse uh, and a thing I, I hope you feel like you learned, right? We jumped into geometric perception. There's a party going on somewhere. Of course, we learned, um, you know, iterative closest point and its variance. I would say both the kinematics and the ICP kind of um, work helped me uh, start talking about many of these problems as kinematics problems as optimizations, too. Um, and I think the takeaway that some of you are seeing when you're playing with perception on the, on the project is that you know, these point cloud processing algorithms are very good for refinement if you have a known geometry, but they're not great for the global part of the perception problem. And you really wanted to bring in the deep learning pipeline to help with the, the bigger part of the problem. And you know, it requires, those require models. They're great for accuracy, let's say for refinement, if you will, but they need an initial guess. And remember I said that if, if you were to take away, if you told me I could only have RGB or I could only have depth, my answer would have flipped a few years ago and I'd say, take my depth, keep, I'll keep my RGB. Okay. We built up more into the clutter clearing was the example that I used um, for a few reasons, right? We started to talk about perception in clutter, you know, richer perception that could handle the, you know, occlusions and things like that, uh, about more complicated simulation mechanics, right? And about even programming the, at the task level. Right, so this was scaling up the basic recipe into a really much more sophisticated uh, version of the problem. It also helped make the point that we didn't need to estimate the pose perfectly in order to be successful, because that clutter clearing demo, right, was just using antipodal grasps. It wasn't even thinking about what objects were, and it went pretty far. We jumped into deep perception. Right, we talked about mask our CNN and the like, right? That was the first workhorse. If you're starting to do perception in, in the real world, you might very well still be using mask our CNN. Uh, we talked about deep pose estimation. the category level versions of this with, for instance, dense object, dense descriptors and key points, for instance, being an alternative to, to actually estimating the pose, maybe key points are enough, or dense descriptors. These are super powerful methods. They're getting better. I mean, they're data hungry. I think if there's one thing that, we've, that we're have we seeing as today's trend that, we're, that will continue uh, is that a lot of the pipelines that started off being hugely successful based on supervised learning are now turning over into self-supervised learning versions of these problems, right? Finding good ways to, to train a visual representation that's sufficient for these kind of downstream tasks using unlabeled data. Is the big is the big new trend? Not even that new anymore. Okay. We did motion planning. Like we covered a lot of stuff, right? We did motion planning, which started with just richer spelling of inverse kinematics. 
right? All the power you've used. And a lot of you guys are using inverse kinematics only, actually, I'd say, um, you know, calling a lot of sequential inverse kinematics calls. And a handful of times I've been saying, you know, maybe you should turn that into a kinematic trajectory optimization, right? Why? Because solving a bunch of inverse kinematics calls independently is good, but it doesn't actually ask them to be related to each other in any smooth or, or subtle way. And so kin I tried to say the kinematic trajectory optimization was just inverse kinematics with the constraint that the inverse kinematic solutions are consistent with each other. They can all be described from one spline. And we talked about sample-based motion planning too. I'll say sampling-based. Right, some powerful tools. I threw in a, some stuff about graphic convex sets there too, of course. But you know, if you remember RRT and PRM, then you've got that basic vocabulary. Do you remember, you know, then all of the stuff about the different ways we're doing control <clears throat> on the manipulator? <clears throat> We had our, our next foray into force control and manipulator control. Can you remember the, you know, why PID control is good but inverse dynamics control is better if you have a model? And why we actually use joint stiffness control? In a lot of cases for the, for the robot, right? We, we like to think about executing joint trajectories, but relatively low, with a low stiffness controller so that if we bump into stuff, right, we're still compliant enough to, to keep moving and not break our robot or the environment. Um, <clears throat> but we also talked about direct force control where you're thinking explicitly about the forces, or indirect force control, like jo uh, Cartesian impedance control, or Cartesian stiffness control. One of my favorite examples that came up with that, actually, remember the, um, a few people are doing writing projects, right? And uh, I, I gave a, a, the MeshCat painter, right? A little thing that just says, put a chalk, weld it to your hand if you want, and and draw some lines, okay? And it was interesting to have the conversations with people because in the, in the case where the chalk is welded to your finger, the difference between force control and just a diff IK control, for instance, with the, with the joint stiffness control or in inverse dynamics is small because you could put, you just put yourself into a reasonable amount of penetration you move yourself around, and that's all good. The, the robot will, you might have to do a little tuning to not push too hard, because otherwise the chalk will get stuck. If you don't push hard enough, it might not draw. But pretty much you just tune in once how deep to push. You follow your trajectory. Life is good. But the people who switched from welding it to the finger to holding the chalk had a different experience, yeah? So as soon as you push down, the chalk might move in your fingers. As you draw, it might start moving in your fingers. And suddenly there, if you just picked a nice trajectory and started moving around, okay, then you might have drawn for a little while and now you stop drawing, or you, you know, because it moved in your fingers. And it's hard to know where the, thing, where the chalk is in your fingers. So actually, this is a beautiful case where if you think about the space of forces, you just say, I'd like to be pushing down with a certain amount of force, then even if the chalk moves, it, the end effector will move for you in order to keep yourself in contact with the, with the table. We talked about controlling not just the robot, but then the whole, you know, the objects in the world, right? I used the language of visual motor policies to talk about that. I really think something great happened when we started putting cameras at high rate into our controllers we need to understand it better. 
You know, right now I'd say our ability to get visual motor policies is still a little weak. We did it with behavior cloning. We talked about it with RL policy search, for instance. But we should have more powerful, reliable ways to get visual motor policies. They're very good. They're still, we're, still, we're still working on it. Okay, but this is the stuff that's making the rock star manipulation demos right now, right? I showed you rolling dough. There's all kinds of things that visual motor policies can do that are surprising. And then we wrapped up with, um, you know, intuitive physics, learning models. task and motion planning, and uh, a little bit of belief space today. So that's a lot of coverage, right? We've covered a lot of things, some of them more carefully and some of them just quickly at the end. But I think it's a pretty good representation of what's happening in a modern manipulation system. When I reflect on the class, and maybe what I'll do next time, let's say, just, you know, but, um, the one thing that I, I, I think this overly emphasizes, and maybe um, I wish I would emphasize more, I think I'm gonna put mobile manipulation earlier in the class, because I think it opens up, I didn't realize, I mean, I think the tools are actually not that different to solve mobile manipulation. The math is the same, but the, the ideas you would have for your projects, I think are gonna be different. I think Bayan's lecture yesterday really emphasized that, right? You, you wouldn't ask, you know, a, a chatbot, you know, what should I do with, you know, you know, go get me a Coke or something like that if, it's, if you're limited to the world of your table. And I think the, the open vocabulary ideas, the anything could happen in the world, you're going to send your robot off and do anything, wheels help you think about that, right? You have to be, you have to, I don't know, you could bring a lot of things to yourself in a conveyor belt, but it's not, it's not the same. Okay, so even though the math is actually very similar, I'm going to probably make a bigger emphasis on mobile manipulation next, next time. Um, you know, there are some different parts of the math where you, people think about navigation and, and mapping and, and other um, scene level kind of perception problems that would come along with that. But I think the biggest thing for me is just the needing to think about the open, open domain, open vocabulary part of the world. For me, and I'm saying this partly so you can agree with me or disagree with me over anonymous feedback is fine. You, you can shout it out right now, that's fine. Um, the other thing that I think I wanna uh, emphasize, and I said it on, on Tuesday, I wanna give a few more tools um, that you could, in your projects, for instance, use for the task level reasoning. I think if you could have just written a, a padiddle uh, specification, you might not love writing padiddle, it's, it's kind of a weird, but, uh, but it's very powerful to be able to think about longer, or you know, longer term tasks, more abstract tasks. And I think the, I'm thinking that the presentation focused a little bit more on the, the dexterous part of manipulation and a little less about the, the world part. But you can leave with a slightly, you know, knowing that there's other parts. In fact, it's interesting kind of to think about when I was thinking about that, um, that dichotomy, uh, you know, it just happens that at TRI, right, the, um, the org chart is kind of telling, right? So there's a, there's a dexterous manipulation team, but there's also a mobile manipulation team, separate. And it really does bring, they're complementary. There's a lot of problems that you get into, you know, you, where you don't need, you, the, the mobile manipulation team, I showed you their grocery store robot, they were happy with a suction gripper for a lot of things. They weren't thinking about the dexterity required, but they're moving through the world and experiencing things that my robot on the table is not experiencing, right? And once I said that, I realized, okay, well, I, I haven't said enough about soft robots. There's a soft robotics team. <laughs> And there's also a human robot interaction team. I'll write it out since it's. Right, we 
mentioned soft, and I, and I offered to spend a lecture talking about tactile sensing, but, um, but we didn't get to that one, okay. And human-robot interaction I, is hugely important. I just, it's not my expertise, really, but. Any thoughts or questions or anything about that high-level scope stuff? Feedback? Yeah. What would be the next steps? What would be the next steps for you as a manipulator, a, a, a robot programmer? Uh, yeah, for you as students, yeah. I mean, there are a lot of really good classes. I don't know which of them you've taken and which you, of you haven't. I mean, I'll be teaching under Actuator, which I've advertised a few times uh, in the spring, but there's um, great classes by Luca Carlone about um, perception and state estimation and the like. There's, there's, in fact, I could offer, I could just summarize a list of some of the, the great classes, maybe on a Piazza post. Um, I'd love to, I'd be happy to do that. We have a lot of good classes on campus. Maybe not enough, actually. I would love to see more. Yeah. It's for research toolkit rather than what people are applying robots versus other robots. Um, that's a great question. Is this a research toolkit or is this a you know I'm I need a robot to move today to make my startup work kind of toolkit? I think um, there's a lot of robots that do things that you'd consider to be manipulation that don't use a big part of the stack, but they are the the places where the world is more constrained. So the classic example would be a factory room floor where you're welding or something like this. It uses maybe force control, a lot of uh, position uh, programming and the like, but it doesn't need to think about perception. It doesn't need to think about all the uncertainty and complexity or even planning that comes with the fact that the world could be very diverse. And I think in industry, startups, you know, big companies are now investing a lot in the next generation of robots, starting with more flexible manufacturing, flexible logistics, the Amazon problem, the delivery problems, and I think that they are hitting this straight up. This is, a, this is core material for that kind of a job, and then absolutely there's research that is taking every one of those and pushing farther. But I think as soon as you start needing to perceive the world in order to do your manipulation, and that's driven by the task, then the old stuff isn't getting it done, and this, this stuff is bread and butter. Yeah, thank you. So people ask me to predict the future. I can't do that, but I'll give you a few thoughts if you want. So, um, in fact, I, uh, you know, Rod Brooks, another famous roboticist that got to, uh, you know, went off and, was the lab director and uh, then started a company. And, but he, I took his class when I was a student, Embodied Intelligence. I think, it, I think it was called Embodied Intelligence, yeah. Um, <clears throat> he always says that uh, people have a tendency, he reminds us, it's not his quote, I guess, but people have a tendency to overestimate the importance of a new technology in the short term and under, dramatically underestimate the, the potential in the long term. So it just means I'm just saying everything I'm about to say is wrong. But, uh, but I do think there's some huge trends that, that we've seen enough of to, to lean into, right? Um, I'd say, actually, Bullion's talk last time is one of the biggest ones. The idea that we could have more common sense priors to make decisions with robots, I think is the biggest change coming to the field in a long time, maybe, and it's happening, you know, it's starting, we've always wanted it. And I don't think we're quite there with, with large language models, but I, I'd say like the large language models and the visual language models and the like um, that Bayan talked about, are, that's like the first compelling approach to say we're going to get something kind of that smells like an unnatural intelligence common sense, right? And I don't even know how to measure the potential change in that that's going to happen with that. It's going to be, um, it's going to be weird. I can guarantee that. That's a, that's a high probability prediction, right? 
but it's I think it's really one of the the biggest things that's going to change what we're we're doing. Um, it's sort of interesting. The people I talk to about this, um, they actually say that uh, maybe they're just trying to make me feel better, but. Uh, but they say it's interesting because there's so many people are excited about this and they want to think about how to make robots do these multi-level tasks that in some ways it actually puts a premium on motion planning that just works and feedback control and skills and other things. All, you know, the, the stuff that I did maybe emphasize a lot in the class is suddenly really important because there's, you know, engineers everywhere that don't know that yet and the robots don't work all the time. Um, but if they did, we could do incredible long-term tasks now. So I actually think, in a weird way, this, um, you know, not manipulator equation driven thing is probably going to put a premium on some of the core manipulation skills, let me say. The lower level, slightly lower level stuff. including, you know, dexterous style manipulation. I would say that um, we're going to see, so I obviously like simulation, um, but I think we've turned a few corners with simulation, and I would expect that the use of simulation is, I, I think it's just like at the beginning of what we're going to see in this field, and it's going to continue to change rapidly. Um, I think some percentage of the robotics population is converted and says, I believe that if it worked in simulation, I'd have a pretty good chance of it working in reality. The people that are training perception systems on simulated data are pretty convinced, I think. I think less people are convinced about the contact mechanics. Um, I mean, I, we focused on it more than a lot of people, and there's a sim, sim to real gap in the, in the contact mechanics. And, you definitely have to be a skilled user of simulation to make that transfer. You could set parameters wrong, but, uh, but I think if, you, if you're a skilled user of simulation, then more and more people believe that you can do your work in simulation. The bottleneck there is content, right? How do you get your robot, your art assets, your objects that you want to manipulate into simulation? And I think there's going to be just probably a huge uh, change in content, we're already seeing it with, um, it's funny, when someone says, well, like five years ago, ten, let's say 10 years ago just to be safe, people said, um, said I, have, I built a simulator. They'd mean they wrote like F equals MA down and they would, maybe they wrote a renderer that's part, part of a simulator, right? But now if someone says I've got a new simulator, they don't even, they, they built something on top of a physics engine and they don't even cite the physics engine, to, to, but, but uh, but it's, they're like now, <laughs> this is why I'm laughing. They're, you know, there's these, I think, very important content aggregators, right? People that just say, I've scanned a bunch of houses, and I've put a bunch of different objects in those houses, and that's my new simulator offering. And I think that's valuable. That's hugely valuable. So we're seeing people generate that data in lots of different ways, sometimes with manual effort. Sometimes with procedural generation, you can make a program that spits out random living rooms, right? And increasingly what we're seeing is real to sim kind of work, right? Um, I think this is just going to be a huge component. The fact that you can drive around Stata with just an RGB camera, come out with a perfect neural radiance field uh, representation of it, you know, and then, so what do you do with that? How do you get that into a simulator? Uh, it's not enough, it turns out, to feed the, feed the simulator, but people are thinking about this now, right? How do, you, how do I just ingest so that the robot, every time it sees something new, it, puts, it adds it to the simulator and we build the matrix? Um, I, I, I predict that that would be a huge, that's going to just ramp up more and more and more. I guess along that route, I think maybe an easy one to say, but let's just think about it for a minute. I think big data hasn't come to robotics yet, but it's coming. It's come through large language models and visual models, but the thing that we're waiting for is, uh, let me say, interaction data, right? It's data that has forces. We talked about in the system ID world that 
If I watched an object fall on YouTube, there's limits to what I can learn about it, right? I can't learn its mass, for instance, right? And I think um, we're getting to the, to the world where people are deploying enough robots and thinking seriously about how to aggregate that data. Um, fleet learning is a huge potential that you know, all the robots on the edge, as edge nodes, pool their understanding, pool their models, pull their data to learn something more about the world than they can learn by uh, surfing the web, right? And that's coming, but it, every year we say it's coming and it's still, it's taking a long time. Considering how important it is, it's taking a long time. It's, it's sort of frustrating that, uh, that we don't quite have it yet. It's, it's hard to, because the data that you generate on your robot, it's not exactly the data I want to generate on my robot. And so it's not immediately useful. You have to think about off policy RL and all these, but even the distribution shift can be really tough, okay? But we're gonna, there's gonna be a crossing point where we have enough robots and they're similar enough, or we have enough copies of the same robot and we, maybe we consolidate hardware or something where, where suddenly I'm gonna program my robot completely differently because you generated a lot of data, right? Also, the same thing too is that a lot of the work we're doing here, we're kind of programming the robot as if it's the first time it ever experienced this. Uh, and we think a lot about learning as, okay, I started with my policy parameters as, you know, zero, random numbers around zero, how do I do that? And that's not the world we're gonna be living in, right? We're gonna be living in a world where um, there are many robots that have already done most of these things and I should start with their hive mind, uh, you know, global model and maybe specialize for my current situation. So that's gonna, that's definitely coming to this, this neck of the woods too. And maybe just to, to, to say a last one, um, I think uh, I've said it a few times, but I'm just very optimistic about theory of ML, RL, control, um, you know, coming together with empirical stuff. I think the empirical success of these things raced ahead, but you know, now we have many of the, the best theorists in the world that are excited about understanding those better, and I think that is just gonna be a very harmonious future. I mean, we have, uh, I should, I don't know, Scott Aronson, right, is our quantum computation guy. He's, he saw GPT-3 and now he's open, open AI for, uh, I think, I, I hope I'm not wrong, Scott. Um, you know, but, but to have a, the quantum computation people get so excited by these large models that they have to go figure them out. That's good, that's great, right? That's like bringing all the really great people together. And I'm just very, I mean, the controls people are so smart. They're so, so smart, you know? And they now see that some of the things that, we're, that have happened in RL and they're, they're moving in that direction, right? And I'm very optimistic about that and how that changes things. So if I were to just like, uh, at a meta level, uh, try to convince you of something, uh, it's maybe, it's, I think it's in this space, which is, and I said it on day one and I'll say it again to, to close this off here. Um, I mean, for me, this class even, and the notes as they slowly evolve and uh, you know, the way I think about it, I think um, because the systems we're building here are so complicated, we have to think rigorously about them. And I think having a foundation of the things we know and rigorous thinking about the things that we're still inventing is just so important. And I think if you talk to the best empirical machine learning people and the most influential papers and you look at the authors or you look at the style of the papers, um, you know, they're extremely rigorous. I think people get the impression that, um, that you can put a quick algorithm together, you can make some curves and you're good, but that's no, those aren't the papers that are having massive impact. And so I really, I really want us to take the time to think deeply about these problems and, and build a foundation of, you know, across these, these complicated disciplines and you know, push the, I think that's what's gonna push the field forward. Maybe, maybe more, now than in uh, some other times. There's just been such a bubbling up of ideas and I think it feels, like, it feels to me like it's time to, to consolidate a little bit and then push forward again. But 
Good. Okay, so um, that's it for me. It's your turn. So the, Anthony sent out the uh, logistics for Tuesday, but basically, I think, and, and his text is the gospel, if I say anything different right now, but the basic gist is please come. Come at 2, because it's going to take longer than an hour and a half to do it. If you come at 2.30, that's fine, but if you can come at 2, it's great. It really is like the best part of the class. And please, when you're presenting or making your videos, you know, the, um, think about what you learned that you wish other people knew. That's the value. And that's what, I get tons of value out of that, of learning about the things that you thought were going to work that didn't work, you know, um, I, of an I, algorithm you tried that we, we haven't covered or I haven't thought about that much. I, I, I hear your experiences and I understand things better because of them. And so that's what I think you can all get that out of each, each other next week. Um, you know, the goal is, to, so once you put your name on the sheet, we're going to march down the sheet. People in the room will put up first. Uh, we've had a few times where someone would sit in the room for a really long time watching people who aren't there. And so, so if you're here in the room then, then you're, and you've marked your uh, video as public, right? So you can, you know, when you upload to YouTube, you can make it public or unlisted. The public videos means we're going to show it and we'll show it even on, on uh, the live stream because some people will watch remotely. Um, if it's unlisted, it's still on the spreadsheet, so you can watch everybody's videos. I mean, the, 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 the class, your, member, your, your members of the class are your audience, whether you're listed, unlisted or, or public. But the broader world is, is only your audience if you mark your video public. Okay? And, uh, you know, I've got a room till five. We'll see what we do. We're going to march through as many as we can. Try to give a little space for questions. There's a lot of you, and, uh, and it takes time to march through the videos. But I, it, please come. It's, it's really, really a fun part of the class. And I know there's people like all over that are going to be watching because they've, they've seen awesome projects in the past, right? And I, and I think they're going to see awesome projects this time. And it's not about how well your robot works. It's about how much you learned and how you can communicate that. Okay? Okay, good. See you Tuesday. I'm excited. <laughs>